inform all participants that today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. To ask a question during the question and answer portion, please press star 1 on your phone to ask a question. Please stand by. Your conference will begin momentarily. Welcome and thank you for standing by. All participants will be able to listen only until the question and answer portion of today's conference. At that time, to ask a question, please press star 1. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. You may begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Steve Seislow from NASA Communications. We are here today for the uh, post-flight readiness review Media Telecon ahead of the launch of Crew 7 and the return of Crew 6. Our participants today are Ken Bowersox, Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA, Steve Stitch, Manager of the Commercial Crew Program for NASA, Joel Montabano, Manager of the International Space Station Program for NASA, Emily Nelson, Chief Flight Director. Bill Gerstenmeyer, Vice President, Build and Flight Reliability at SpaceX. Frank Devin, Program Manager, International Space Station for the European Space Agency, or ESA. Janichi Sakai, Program Manager for the International Space Station from the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA. And Amir al Saya El Ghaffari, Assistant Director General, Aerospace Engineering Sector at Mohammed Ben Rashid Space Center in UAE. Crew 7 getting ready to launch, um, getting ready to launch uh, Friday morning. And first up is Ken Bowersox. Hey, thanks, Steve. And thanks uh, to everybody online for, for joining us this evening or uh, morning or, or whatever it is where, where you are. I know we've got folks that uh, link in sometimes from all around the world. Um, the Space Station is as busy as ever uh, as we approach our 23rd year of continuous human presence with our international partners. Um, one more step in our journey is completion of the flight readiness review for the Crew-7 uh, mission as well as a return of the Crew-6 astronauts. It was a good review today of the Falcon 9 rocket, the Dragon spacecraft. We talked about the crew and the status of the space station. Um, at the conclusion of the review, uh, everybody pulled go, and we're proceeding towards a launch uh, at 3.49 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time on Friday for Crew-7. And then uh, the uh, return of Crew-6 will be um, roughly five days later, five or more days later, depending on weather. Um, and, and so I won't uh, say a date. Um, and we'll do that when the conditions are right to, to bring the crew home. Um, the uh, FRR uh, is, uh, is a, a, a really great part of our process here at NASA. Um, we bring a lot of folks together. Uh, we all um, uh, talk about the mission. Uh, we have a chance to air any uh, dissenting opinions uh, that, that may have come up during the reviews. But it's just one, one step 
Um, there's lots of other reviews that happen uh, ahead of the, the final flight readiness review at different levels throughout the organization, uh, each with a greater and greater uh, degree of, of thoroughness and detail working up to that final readiness review uh, at the agency level. I want to thank uh, all the folks here with me, all of our international partners, and uh, all of our program and, uh, and our, our uh, commercial partners uh, who helped make all those reviews possible, who, who gathered all the data and did all the work to prepare us for the review today and, and get us to a go for the launch for Cruise 7. Um, and now uh, to share some of those details, um, I'll pass this over to Steve Stitch. Thanks, Ken, and uh, thanks to all the reporters uh, and for the interest of joining us this evening. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the entire NASA and SpaceX team for all the hard work to get to the flight readiness review today. It, it, it's kind of like the tip of the work that you see today. I mean, all the reviews, all the engineering analysis, all the inspections of the vehicle, a tremendous amount of work. As Ken said, uh, we all pulled go today to proceed toward launch, uh, 3.49 a.m. Eastern on this Friday, the 25th. That docking time uh, for a launch this Friday would be um, 2.02 a.m. Eastern, uh, one day later on Saturday, August the 26th. And we do have backup opportunities uh, uh, as well for launch on Saturday and Sunday as well, so if we need those. Uh, the vehicle is doing well. Um, the vehicle rolled out to the pad. Um, the, the launch vehicle and Dragon are in the vertical configuration, and right now the teams are uh, preparing the vehicle, uh, getting the Dragon ready for uh, what's called a dry dress or a, a rehearsal where the crew will go out, get in the vehicle, the entire team will practice the timeline all the way from when the crew suits up, gets out into the vehicle, close the hatch, and prepare for the, for the launch just like we would on, uh, on, any, on launch day. Uh, that T0 time, we practice it just like it would be. Uh, it will be um, Tuesday, early Tuesday morning at 3.49 Eastern would be the T0 for that practice run. And then after that, we'll uh, put the Falcon 9 first stage through its paces. We'll do about a, a six-second uh, firing of those engines, and that will happen around 7.49 Eastern um, Tuesday morning. We'll test the rocket one last time to make sure the engines perform well, and then we'll step back and review that data jointly with SpaceX. Uh, I would say the review today was very thorough. Um, hard to believe it's our seventh crew rotation flight. Uh, we had a few special topics that we talked about today um, at the review. I think we mentioned to you um, uh, in the last media telecon, we've had uh, some corrosion on some low flow prop isolation valves. This started back on uh, the cargo flight, CRS-28. We had a, a valve that stuck uh, closed on the oxidizer side uh, on that mission. Um, teams did a tremendous job uh, once that spacecraft got back, pulling the valve out, inspecting that valve and understanding the corrosion on that valve, and then pulling valves off of many other vehicles and looking at those. Uh, we went ahead on this particular vehicle on Endurance, which is making its third flight. We swapped out uh, some of the tank ISO valve um, components and, and remediated those for flight, and we've got a good uh, path forward and good rationale for the rest of the valves on the vehicle. Uh, the corrosion is caused by uh, oxidizer vapors mixing with a little bit of moisture, and uh, the materials are corrosion resistant. but if you get enough um, vapor from the oxidizer along with water, you can form a little bit of acid and get some corrosion. So we're in good shape for flight. We wanted to understand it very thoroughly, and so we spent the last uh, month or so looking at data. SpaceX did testing of different valves all across the country. We actually took one valve and analyzed it at the Marshall Space Flight Center as well. Uh, the other special topic we talked about is a system that we monitor very carefully. It's our parachute system. Um, back on Crew-5 landing, one of the drogue parachutes was a little slower to inflate. It took almost five seconds to fully inflate after the first drogue parachute fully inflated. Uh, we developed a model. Uh, both SpaceX developed their own model and NASA. We looked through that dynamics, and we uh, cleared that issue for flight as well. We had to look at it not only for normal return, but for any abort cases as well. And so... The parachute system is something that we monitor very carefully. We have imagery of the chutes at every landing. SpaceX has done a great job recovering those chutes uh, from every single landing, and we continue to watch that system very carefully. Um, I would say at the pad, uh, we are in good shape. Um, you know, we moved the launch date to the 25th uh, to allow SpaceX to do some work at the pad. All that work is complete. The cladding on the, on the crew tower is complete. The pad's in good shape. 
and it's checked out and ready for flight. Um, you know, the next steps are really to get into uh, to the dry dress and uh, the static fire, and we take it one step at a time. Uh, we'll also monitor any other flights that SpaceX has. A tremendous amount of work by the team. I'm tremendously proud of the team, and uh, we'll fly when we're ready, and I'll turn it over to Joel. Hey, thank you, Steve, and thank you for joining us. Uh, Space Station continues to be a very busy outpost, and in that spirit, we had a progress undock last night, and that sets us up for a progress launch, 85 progress launch, tomorrow, Tuesday, at 2108 Eastern Time. And that progress will be on a trajectory to dock Thursday evening, 2350 Eastern Time, or just a few minutes before midnight on Friday Eastern. As was mentioned by Steve and Ken, we finished our flight readiness review today. We met for uh, a little under seven hours or so. Uh, all pulled go for the continuing preparation for launch. Uh, this vehicle docked to the Zenith port or the space facing port. Uh, Steve mentioned the uh, launch time of 0349 Eastern Friday and the docking uh, just after 2 a.m. Eastern on Saturday. A uh, hatch opening will be about two hours later and this vehicle will stay docked on board ISS for about six months. Uh, the Crew-6 undocked will be five dock days after this vehicle is there. That's enough time for a good handover between the two crews and such that uh, the Crew-7 guys are ready to rock and roll. Uh, Crew-6 undocked will include a fly around, and so um, we're excited to get some good fly around pictures of the, uh, the Russian modules that have been added since the last fly-around photos were taken, the new solar array augmentation that we've done on the USOS site, and so we're looking forward to those pictures and, and getting those distributed out publicly. Um, we're excited to have three international partners on Crew-7. Uh, this Crew-7 team will perform uh, just under 300 experiments while they're there docked for six months with 81 new investigations on board the International Space Station. Uh, looking forward, we're looking for a Soyuz launch on September 15th and a Soyuz undock and land on September 27th. With that, a huge thank you to the Commercial Crew Program, the Space Station Program, our international partners, our SpaceX partners, and everyone involved in making these missions a success. With that, I'll hand over to Emily Nelson. Thanks, Joel. And thanks to everyone for calling in and for telling the story of human spaceflight. Uh, we had a thorough review today, and it was the culmination of a close look at the readiness of the teams on the ground, the crew, and the readiness of our spacecraft. Uh, Jasmine spoke at the start of the meeting this morning and, and talked about the importance of these reviews and the crew's confidence in our process. This crew is really looking forward to launch and their mission on ISS. And meanwhile, Steve and, and his crew on board, Woody, Sultan, and Andre, are wrapping up a really successful mission on ISS, and uh, they and the ground teams are preparing for their safe return. Jasmine, Andy, Satoshi, and Constantine went into quarantine on August 11th. That's about two weeks before launch, which is standard. They arrived here at KSC yesterday morning, and uh, they have started their sleep shift to get ready for Thursday night's launch um, after their next big milestone, which is dry dress tonight, as Steve discussed. They're going to have um, a few more meetings through the week. They'll get a briefing on the weather for launch each day. But beyond that, they're going to spend a few days resting and, and focusing on time with their families before they uh, get ready to strap in and, and launch into space. And with that, I'll hand over to Bill. Thank you, Emily. Again, the flight race review was a very thorough review today. I think it's, it's nice to get a chance to step back and look at all the issues, problems, and things that are going right with the vehicles. We get a chance to take a look at the Falcon vehicle, maybe in a little more in-depth way for crew flights than we do for other flights. Uh, we know the importance of flying crew and the, the trust that the crew puts in us in delivering. You know, SpaceX's job is, is really to deliver crew safely to the space station and return them safely from station. Uh, we treat that extremely seriously as a company. Uh, we put every effort into crew missions. We don't treat them like other missions. They're special for us, and we make sure we're really ready to go and the hardware is really ready to go. And I think this review showed that the teams are ready and we're ready with our hardware and, and systems. We still have two big tests in front of us, the dry dress test to make sure that 
the vehicle is meets the cruise uh, satisfaction. They can get in and out of the vehicle. All the accommodations are good and dragging the way they expect. And then we'll do the, the static fire where we'll get a chance to make sure the Falcon rocket is really ready to go fly. And that'll be a pretty rigorous test. We'll do a detailed data review, and then we'll do the launch readiness review after that. So again, I'd like to thank NASA, ESA, JAXA, Roscosmos, and the UAE and the 45th Space Wing for uh, all the support they give us, the partnership, and helping us to make this Crew 7 launch successful. And now I'll turn it over to Frank DeWin from ESA. Thank you, Bill, and uh, <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Uh, first of all, a uh, big thank you to uh, NASA and uh, the SpaceX team uh, for preparing uh, all the data package that we had to review today. Uh, it gives a great insight uh, for ESA, the European Space Agency, uh, to make sure that uh, our crew members can uh, fly safely to, to orbit. Uh, a number of firsts here for, for ESA. Uh, Andy will be the pilot of the, the SpaceX vehicle. It's the first time that we have a European crew member uh, piloting uh, a SpaceX vehicle, so we are uh, really pr uh, proud of that. And uh, Andy will also be the commander of the ISS crew in the, the later part of his stay uh, for actually uh, several months, uh, three to four months as it's uh, planned today. So we're really looking forward to that. To that. Uh, for ESA, uh, these are very important missions uh, because they can show to our member states the important, uh, importance of uh, human spaceflight and the importance of the science program that we are doing uh, since SpaceX uh, came online. We have uh, four USOS crew members, and this has really uh, uh, improved the science that we can do on board of the space station. We have uh, much more science capabilities, much more science hours or hours that the crew can spend on, uh, on science. And uh, this has been uh, great for ESA, for uh, European uh, ESA member states, uh, and for our science program. Uh, another first in this mission is that uh, we will also have the first uh, European astronaut, uh, project astronaut, flying on a commercial mission with Axiom on Axiom 3. And so we will have, again, uh, two European astronauts on board of the, the space station. And I, I think uh, it was uh, some time ago, at least 10 years ago, that we had uh, that occasion, I think, uh, except from a small handover, I think, uh, between uh, Samantha and uh, Matthias at a certain point. So uh, really excited for, for these missions and uh, looking forward uh, for the launch of uh, Crew 7 on uh, Friday morning. Okay, uh, I'm Takaiju in JAXA program management. And uh, first of all, on behalf of JAXA, I would like to extend my gratitude to the NASA leadership and the space preparing the great presentation today. And uh, all the members on the ground who, who devoted for the Crew 7 launch and uh, continuous ISS operations. I'm honored to help this opportunity to announce Japanese astronauts' flight. And uh, as reported earlier, uh, we have decided to go for the Cruise 7 launch and Cruise 6 return on the condition that something. But uh, that's including the astronauts for Satoshi are ready for the launch. This will be the first flight after the government, uh, our government determined to extend ISS operation beyond 2024 last November. This is going to be the Satoshi's second long-term long -term mission to the ISS. I believe that uh, he will carry out a variety of the missions, uh, which includes life, material, and physical science, and technological demonstration for future run exploration and uh, post-ISS utilization with his excellent colleagues from international partners. This is confident that uh, this progress won't stop and lead to our challenges to the moon, Mars, and beyond. This expertise, expertise uh, cultivated both in space and on the ground will continue contribute to the success in a variety of missions. I'm looking forward to this coming Cruise 7 launch and will continue to work for hard for the final preparations. Thank you. And hand over to MBRSC. Uh, thank you, Junichi. Uh, this is Ahmed from MBRSC. Well, I'd like to start by uh, thanking our colleagues at uh, NASA and uh, SpaceX and all their team members for uh, completing this uh, site with this review and with the other agencies. 
Of course, this brings us closer to the launch of Crew 7 and also at the same time the return of uh, Crew 6, which includes the uh, UAE's astronaut Sultan and Yadi. Uh, well, maybe all of you are aware uh, this is the second uh, UAE human spaceflight mission, but the first uh, long duration mission. Uh, we're very proud uh, to have partnered on this uh, long duration mission uh, where Sultan has taken part. Over the past uh, six months where he has been in space, uh, Sultan has been very busy involved in uh, more than 200 experiments on the ISS. Uh, he performed uh, various uh, maintenance works on the ISS. These kind of uh, experiments have been very instrumental in what we want to do, which is uh, uh, reaching out to the scientific community, researchers, uh, researchers and the students, to be part of this mission, to be part of the space uh, community. And uh, at the same time, he accomplished a number of firsts uh, for the UAE. And uh, mainly uh, would be the first uh, Arab uh, to complete a uh, spacewalk, along with uh, uh, NASA astronaut uh, Steve Bowen. Uh, he has also uh, done uh, close to 20 educational and community uh, outreach events, uh, what we call a call from space. And within this event, he reached out to more than 10,000 people, either uh, through a direct uh, phone calls or video calls or ham radio sessions. Uh, we're very proud with what uh, Sultan did, and uh, he's uh, currently at, uh, in, uh, in his final stages uh, to return to Earth. Uh, big thanks to the teams uh, in Dubai, in the Mission Control Center, and in Houston, to support uh, the mission all the way. Once again, uh, congratulations for this uh, milestone, and we look forward to uh, launch of Crew 6, uh, launch of Crew 7, and the return of Crew 6. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. A uh, note to reporters and media on the call um, to join the uh, Q&A queue, uh, just uh, push star one on, uh, on your phone. We're going to start today with um, Chris Davenport from the Washington Post. Please state your name, your affiliation, and whom your question is directed to. Yeah. Hey, Steve. It's Chris Davenport from the, the Washington Post. Thanks for doing this. Um, for Gers, I guess you touched on this in your opening remarks, but I just wonder, given the, the high cadence of launch that, that you guys are doing, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you guard against complacency and just continuing to remain vigilant, especially when it comes to the, the human spaceflight missions. And then um, for Gerst or Steve, just real quick, when you talk about the, the valves that you were looking at with the corrosion, where on the vehicle um, are those valves or are they throughout or are they in a specific region? Thanks so much. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start a little bit. Uh, I think, first of all, it's important to know that we have separate teams that are monitoring all these activities. So. It's not just one team that's doing Starlink flights and one that's doing crew flights. In fact, we have we can support launches from three pads simultaneously with our support teams the way we are. So we're not overstressed. We're not overworking the workforce. Same thing with the technicians. They're dedicated to various launch sites and various pads and various vehicles. I think, again, I think we're, we're humbled by every time we learn something, we learn some small things. And then we go investigate those things, and then we learn more, and then hopefully we're then preventing some bigger problem from coming in the future. So I think there's, it's a, there's an advantage of flying a lot, and the fact that we get to see these vehicles operate a lot, we get to see the hardware tested in various environments. When we fly Starlink missions, we'll typically higher, fly a higher thrust profile, uh, actually run pumps at higher turbine speeds, um, and then that actually lets us see how the engines really perform. Then we go fly a crew mission. We fly that crew mission at reduced levels with more margin available for the hardware. So I think that gives us another benefit of getting a chance to see this hardware operate in a more stressful environment. And then when we need the high reliability, we back off to more typical kind of values for crew missions. So I think there's a, a good balance between the two. I think it's easy to think that this is easy. Uh, this business is not easy. From the outside, it may look like we're flying a lot of flights and they're all trouble-free. They are not all trouble-free. They are not easy. Every time we fly, we learn something. We spend the time to go analyze it. 
we're very agile in the fact that we can get into tests. We have a lot of vertical integration. We can do things in Hawthorne, tear valves apart, dissect things. We use the NASA team where appropriate. We, we shift some of the work to them to go take a look at, and I think that strength between us both make sure we're ready to fly. So, you know, my words are stay hungry. I say the company's words are stay paranoid. I like hungry better than paranoid, but, but the idea is that you just got to keep looking, and when you find some small problem, you got to really understand what it's trying to tell you, because later, when the big problem happens, you'll see the breadcrumbs that lead all the way back to that little problem at the beginning. The secret is to find those little problems, expand on those, and then help yourself to fly safer in the future. And Steve can talk a little bit about the valve, and I can add some if you want. Yeah, the, the valves are really in what we call the, the service section part of the of the Dragon vehicle. So uh, they're spread all across. There, there's a, a number of panels uh, throughout that vehicle that carry the structural load, and the, the valves are in that area. So outside the crew module, uh, inside the service section, some are under the tank, some are easily accessible. The ones that we were able to, uh, uh, on the oxidizer side, that we were able to go take uh, apart the dry side. The, the valves use an, an armature to go ahead and actuate, so it's an electrically actuated valve. We were able to take uh, the valve apart and replace some of those components on what I would call the, the dry side of the valve that doesn't have propellant, and reassemble those and retest those on the spacecraft, and we know all those valves are functioning just fine. So uh, hopefully I answered your question. And I would say this is a good example of what I tried to describe before. On CRS-28, we had a valve that didn't close. Properly, we as soon as that vehicle landed, we were immediately able to get that valve out, pull it apart, take it apart, analyze it. We shipped a piece of that valve actually to Marshall to go take a look at. They could identify the problem, and then we figured out there's a way that if we actually power the valve a little bit longer, we can actually drive through this corrosion and get back functionality of the valve. So again, we not only solved the problem, identified the magnitude of the problem, how far it was across the fleet, but then we also found a remediation to prevent a future occurrence if something like this shows up in flight. Thank you. And again, media can push star one to join the Q&A or star two to drop out of the Q&A. Next up is Stephen Clark from Ars Technica. Hi, Steve. I think my question will be just to follow up on Chris's uh, to Gerst. Um, can you point to, we heard the ISO valve thing on Dragon, the parachute, uh, drug parachute uh, thing that you looked at on Dragon. Uh, can you point to a couple of things that you've learned on some recent Starlink flights uh, with this high cadence or any other Falcon 9 launch on the, the launch vehicle side that has caused you to go back and kind of reassess something or inspect something on a uh, launch vehicle for a crew mission? Thanks. Yeah, and one of our flights, we had a, a a pogo valve, which is a valve in the uh, it prevents the propellant from moving up and down in the system, and that that valve stayed open, and we had an oxidizer leak on one of our Falcon Heavy flights. Uh, we were able to go in and inspect and see some corrosion um, in that valve. So again, we were able to then go inspect this vehicle, and we did an inspection to make sure that it was fine and okay to go fly. So I think that's an example of of an, another valve, not one of these nitrogen tetroxide valves, but another valve in the, in the oxygen system that, that had some salt water in it that, that ended up with corrosion. We were able to go, go find and, and remediate. Uh, we also had some cases where we saw some leakage in an acceptance test program of one of our valves on Falcon 9. Uh, we then went and investigated that particular leak and tried to understand where it came from. It came from an, an earlier step that was missed in a procedure, and then we pulled, or we essentially we said all the valves associated with that procedure were suspect, and then we're working through the process of identifying that all those valves are fine to go fly. So I think these are examples of things that we see on these other flights that, that carry forward and, and we can learn from and, and help prevent future problems. And I would add from a NASA perspective, I mean, it, the, the SpaceX flights for Starlink and others really help us out. SpaceX sometimes can fly a change uh, that will cut in on a crew flight much later, but they'll fly it on an earlier Starlink flight. We can watch that uh, new component or the change in the component, how it flies in the flight environment, and come back and look at the data and then get comfortable with it for a crew flight. S same thing with the cargo dragons. You know, we fly... Uh, sometimes small changes on uh, on the parachute system. For example, we're flying on uh, Crew-7 uh, 
on the energy modulator, which is kind of a, a shock absorber strap that goes between uh, as we pull out the main bags from the drogue parachutes uh, during that deployment sequence. Uh, we're flying some ties on that uh, to, to keep the straps uh, intact and, and not contact uh, other parts of the system during deployment. So we flew those on a cargo flight first, um, watched that over actually several cargo flights. Now we're flying it on a crew flight uh, for the first time on Crew 7. So. Thank you. And next is Marcia Dunn from Associated Press. Uh, yes, hello. Um, for Steve, I suppose, I'm not sure, perhaps someone else would like to add. Um, was it just chance that four partners are represented on this mission on the crew? Um, do you see it as a one-off fluke? Will there be more instances of this? And what do you see as the value of having NASA occupying just one seat and sharing the other three? Thank you. So this is Joel Marshall. I'll take a cut at that. Um, so, you know, we share the cost of operating the International Space Station across the partnership. So as people fly, uh, as we have people in space, each partner gains um, crew time on orbit, and that's based on their contribution. And so the way the, way the timing worked out for this one uh, with our integrated crew agreement that we have with um, Roscosmos, it was time for these other folks to fly. And so will that happen in the future? It, it may happen. It, it all depends on, you know, the days in orbit. So um, it's, we're excited to have this. The international partners are a big part of the International Space Station. You know, I'll tell you, and, and maybe some of my international partners want to comment, that makes us as strong as we are today, the partnership. And so anytime we can have these opportunities, I think it's a good thing. And from a CCP perspective, we know we're excited to fly. Uh, our first compliment of having a, uh, an astronaut from each of the partners on our vehicle, and in particular, you know, Andy flying as the pilot is a very big deal for us. He's certainly qualified with his background, and he's gone through all the right training uh, at SpaceX and NASA and ready to go fly the flight, and that's pretty exciting for us. Thank you. And David Curley for the Discovery Channel. You're next. Thanks very much. Uh, Joel, uh, ASAP uh, in the last two quarterly meetings has talked about uh, the leaks uh, in the Russian module. Um, can you give us a sense of, uh, you know, they talked about repairs and filling them. Is this, is this age? Is it stress on the system? And generally, uh, what is your level of concern? Thank you. All right. Good question, David. So uh, let me just kind of level set everybody. So we've uh, identified two cracks and then an area of interest uh, in that part of the, of the, uh, the service module there. And, and cracks, we're talking, um, you know, people think of cracks. Uh, these, each crack that we talk about is on the order of about an inch, actually a little less than an inch. And the width of that crack, uh, about the size of a couple salt crystals, and so pretty small areas, uh, you'd have to have a much larger crack uh, before you were worried about it. So what have we done? We've stopped drilled the cracks. We've patched it. Um, we are, flew some hardware on the last Northrop Grumman Cygnus mission to go ahead and uh, do an inspection of that patch without removing the patch so we can do an ultrasonic inspection such that we can confirm that the, uh, the crack is not growing. In addition, we've gotten some hardware samples of the metal from Roscosmos that was used, um, samples that was used of that module, and we're doing some additional testing. So uh, while I'll tell you today, the, the leak is less than a pound a day of air. Um, we are watching it. Um, it it's something that uh, we want to understand the root cause. We have a couple theories. Uh, the team's not ready to go ahead and say, yep, we've identified the root cause, but they do have some theories. I'm not uh, concerned from a, a long-term standpoint. Today it's more of a logistics challenge to make sure that we're replenishing that air. So from that standpoint, uh, we'll continue to watch it. We'll continue to learn. Uh, we'll continue to do testing. And so in another probably uh, towards the end of the year, I can give you an update on, on where we end up. Thank you. And Jeff Faust from Space News, you're next. 
Hi, Jeff Faust of Space News. Question for Steve Stitch to return to the valve issue. Um, is there any commonality between the corrosion you saw in the Dragon valves and the earlier corrosion issue with Starliner valves? And is there anything from the Starliner investigation that helped with the Dragon uh, valve investigation? Thanks. Yeah, thank, thanks for the question, Jeff. I, I, I would say the, the mechanism for the corrosion is somewhat similar where um, we have on the valves an environmental seal that that leaks a little bit of uh, vapor across and into the dry side of the valve, which is the electrical part that actuates the valve, um, and then forms uh, forms corrosion on the components inside with the, combined with a little bit of moisture. So I, I would say we learned quite a bit from the investigation we did on Starliner, and it probably helped us uh, a little get to, to the root cause a little bit faster um, on the, the dragon valve issue. The materials inside the valves are a little different, and so the kind of corrosion is a little different between the, the Dragon valve and the Starliner valves, uh, but it's a similar mechanism. You know, SpaceX, as Bill talked about, um, got the valve out very quickly um, and was able to, uh, to work through that and understand the mechanism for the corrosion, and then the team did a great job. One of the things we learned uh, is it's important to have a, a purge up on the system, so in other words, in the service section, have some very dry air, dry nitrogen uh, flowing through that whole system to take vapors away from any area to where that corrosion will start. And that mitigation is a very similar mitigation to what uh, what the Boeing team is using on the Starliner service module. So there's a parallel uh, to that as well. I think we're learning a little bit about capsules and, and valves uh, between uh, the two different uh, vehicles, Starliner and, and Dragon. And, uh, you know, we have a little bit more work to do long term, I think, uh, on the Dragon vehicles, how to remediate the corrosion for the long, long term, because we really want to refly each one of these flights, you know, uh, vehicles up to five times. So uh, thanks for the question. Thank you. And next is Will Robinson Smith from Space Flight Now. Hi, thanks for taking my question. That actually provides a, a very nice segue to what I was going to ask there to both um, Steve as well as to uh, Bill Gersenmeyer. With the Crew Dragon Endeavor now um, being on its fourth flight coming back down, what did you learn sort of taking a step back, big picture, about the longevity of the Dragon spacecraft and, you know, what are, what are kind of the, the, the last steps needed towards getting to that fifth flight, and then I guess question more specifically to Bill, um, can you update us on the progress of the upcoming uh, Crew Dragon that's in the work now, expected to debut still in 2024, or what's the timeline now on that? Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the first part of the question. Um, yeah, I think I think we are learning one thing, the, val the, the valves uh, on the Crew six vehicle in orbit are cycling just fine, and so it is on its fourth flight. And when it returns, it would fly on its fifth flight. And so um, the tank ISO valves, which haven't had the corrosion removed from them, are working just fine. Uh, there's a manifold valve, which is a valve in between um, a set of pipe and the thrusters itself. Um, those are working just fine. So, so we know all those valves are working fine. What our what our plan really is to do is when that vehicle gets back is to go um, remove some of the valves, take a look at those, understand the corrosion. Uh, we know that vehicle has uh, been in space longer. Actually, the corrosion um, sort of is remediated when you get into space. The, the, the vapor doesn't leak. There's no moisture to form. And, and so we'll take a quick look at that vehicle when we get back. We will likely remove some of the valves, and we'll have to step back and figure out what we do uh, with the remainder of the valves in that vehicle. And I'll let Bill answer the next part of the question. Yeah, I think another important thing is we also have um, at McGregor, we do long duration testing of valves and systems. So we have wetted systems and valves at McGregor so we can actually look at the components and see how they perform over time. I think that helps with the certification kind of discussion. I think the thing we're learning is space and then also getting splashed in the ocean is a little bit different than the environment at McGregor. So we're gonna now improve our McGregor tests a little bit to get a little more high fidelity to tease out some of these problems to eventually get us to the certified life. But we're, we're, as you said, we're working on a new crew vehicle. It'll come sometime in 2024. Thank you. And next is Gina Sanceri, ABC Network News. 
Uh, asked and answered. Thank you. Th thank you, Gina. Um, next, uh, from Kyoto News. Hi, um, I'm Yu Inokuchi for Kyoto News. I have just uh, two quick questions on Crew 7 launch. Uh, firstly, uh, would you give us the estimated launch time on backup dates, uh, that is Saturday and Sunday? And secondly, uh, is there any concern about the weather at the moment uh, for the launch on Friday? Thank you. Yeah, I've got the backup launch times for Saturday and Sunday. Um, uh, Saturday, August the 26th, the launch time would be 3.27 a.m. Eastern time. And then uh, for Sunday, August the 27th, would be 3.04 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, I would say on the weather, we've just started to take a look at the weather. Um, you know, one thing that's favorable for us relative to Florida weather is the launch time uh, being 3.49 a.m. in the morning typically don't get uh, convective activity that we get uh, here in Florida in the afternoon, so that, that time is favorable. And then we get a little closer and we'll start looking at the abort weather up the East Coast and see if there's anything that um, would affect the abort weather. Um, so I don't have a probability of, of a violation or, or go weather for launch, but we'll start looking at that uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. And our last question comes from Ken Kramer, Space Up Close. Hi, thank you for doing this, and um, good luck on um, on, on Friday. Uh, my question is for Frank Devina. Could you um, please give us an update on the European robotic arm? I know some spacewalks were done. Can you tell us, uh, is that work? Is it operational yet? Uh, what will it be doing? And could you also tell us a little bit more about the Axiom 3 mission? Uh, Who will be flying when, uh, why, and why are you doing that? Thank you. Yes, on the uh, European robotic arm, uh, the European robotic arm has been fully qualified and uh, commissioned uh, together with our uh, colleagues from Roscosmos and Energia in uh, the May-June time frame uh, this year. Uh, there was actually a first operational mission that uh, took place, I think, on the 7th or the 8th of August uh, uh, this year as well, where uh, uh, it was used by the Russian crew member as well. Uh, fully by the Russian crew members. So uh, the arm is fully operational, fully qualified. Uh, for what it will be used is uh, really dependent on the, our colleagues from uh, Roscosmos. Uh, as part of the agreement, the, the arm has been transferred to, to Roscosmos. It's now uh, their property, and uh, so it's for them to, to fully use it uh, for the operations of their segment. Uh, it was built, of course, to help them with installation, for example, of science payloads, uh, at the outside uh, of the Russian segment uh, with the Russian airlock uh, that uh, actually the European robotic arm has relocated on, on the MLM. And so uh, science experiments can be taken out now out of the airlock and positioned on the, on the Russian segment. But this is just one example. It can be used for, for many things. Uh, on the Axiom 3 mission, uh, why are we doing this? Uh, uh, of course, uh, ESA has a lot of member states. We have uh, in total now 22 member states that are part of our Telenovi program. Uh, all uh, our member states have, of course, the inspiration or the aspiration to have uh, uh, countrymen uh, fly to space, to have their, uh, their astronauts as well fly to space, uh, to, to have an inspirational program for their citizens, to have uh, an educational program but to advance science and technology in their respective uh, countries. And uh, unfortunately, uh, ESA does not have yet its own human transportation system. Uh, we are working on that. There will be a space summit in uh, November this year where we will ask uh, the top uh, politicians from ESA, ESA member states and heads of state uh, to see if ESA indeed uh, should uh, develop its own transportation system, human transportation system, first uh, cargo and, and then human to, to LEO and later on to the moon, so that we can even become a bad, better partner for uh, our agencies. Uh, I think uh, we have seen this in the International Space Station as well, the fact that uh, we have very strong partners that have uh, complementary capabilities 
uh, is a strength, and uh, we have uh, the International Space Station that has shown this very clearly, and going forward uh, in uh, Moon to Mars and Artemis together with, uh, with our NASA colleagues, we want to be an even stronger partner uh, for NASA in there, so, so that uh, counts in, in that endeavor. Uh, but until we have our own transportation capability, of course, uh, uh, our member states uh, also want to fly uh, their countrymen uh, or countrywomen uh, to space. And the fact that uh, through uh, the private astronaut missions program that NASA has started, we now have this capability of augmenting our uh, ESA crew members that can fly to the International Space Station to do even more science and even more technology and even more uh, educational and inspirational activities. So we are very proud that we can do that. Uh, we will actually have a, uh, an astronaut on, on Axiom 3, uh, but there are uh, more uh, astronauts in the pipeline that, that, that will come. So this is not a one-off. There will be more of those missions coming in the future. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. That was our last question today, so we are going to wrap it up, and the team is going to get back into their launch preparations. Again, launch of Crew 7 coming up Friday morning, 3.49 a.m. Eastern Time. You can follow all of the updates at nasa.gov, also on the Commercial Crew blog. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. Participants, you may disconnect at this time.